One of the most notorious minds behind the Holocaust, Adolf Eichmann's defense of his own crimes led to a new understanding of evil. An ordinary looking man of Austrian German background, Eichmann might have made little impact on the world in a different age. But the rise of the Nazi thrust him to prominence as a leading officer in the SS, their paramilitary organization. His role in the murder of millions of people in concentration camps ensured his place of infamy in the history books, both for his role in the war and for what happened to him after. So how did this man come to redefine evil? Adolf Eichmann was born in Germany in 1906 and moved to Austria with his family while he was still young. He went to the same high school that Adolf Hitler had attended a generation before, but wasn't a successful student. He didn't complete his studies, either at school or at technical college, and left to find work instead, initially for his father's company. The 1920s were uncertain times economically, made worse by the vast economic crash at the end of the decade. Eichmann drifted between low-status jobs as an office worker, laborer, and salesman. Meanwhile, the blight of Nazism was spreading from Germany to Austria. Eichmann joined the Austrian branch of the party in 1932 and quickly became a member of the Schutzstaffel, or SS, the paramilitary wing responsible for brutally enforcing the party's will. In 1933, the Nazis seized power in Germany but were banned in Austria. Along with many other Austrian Nazis, Eichmann fled to Bavaria, where he joined the Austrian Legion, the party's organization for Austrians in exile. He received military training and did work for the party, starting to rise through the ranks and into the Psyker Heitsdienst, or SD, the SS's intelligence agency. The Nazis had given him a focus and purpose that his life had previously lacked. In November 1934, Eichmann obtained a transfer to the part of the SD that specialized in spying on and plotting against Jewish people. He helped create plans to encourage Jews to emigrate from Germany and even traveled to Palestine to explore the possibility of sending them there. During the annexation of Austria in 1938, he led a raid on a Jewish cultural center before organizing an office in Vienna responsible for plans to drive Jewish people out of Austria. Following the outbreak of war in September 1939, the Nazis abandoned the pretense of letting Jewish people decide their own future, replacing a policy of emigration with one of deportation. Eichmann was sent to Berlin to take up a prominent position at the central office responsible for this. He immediately began planning the deportation of Jewish people from Germany and Austria to concentration camps in Poland, camps which most would never leave alive. By now, Eichmann's career was inextricably linked with Nazi crimes against Europe's Jewish population. He continued to rise through the ranks of the SS, reporting directly to Reinhard Heydrich, the founding leader of the SD and one of the chief architects of the Holocaust. Eichmann became a specialist within the organization, with expertise on Jewish people living in Nazi territory and the party's plans for them, plans which he helped to create. Plans that were increasingly stained with blood. In the summer of 1941, the Nazi High Command gave Heydrich orders to prepare a plan for what they called the total solution of the Jewish question, the destruction of a population of millions who had lived peacefully for generations in countries now under Nazi control. In September, Heydrich told Eichmann that Hitler's orders were for all the Jews under their control to be killed. Hitler's fanatical hatred drove him to sickening extremes, and men like Eichmann accepted their place in his plan. If doing his job meant murdering millions, then Eichmann was willing to do so. On January 20, 1942, 15 senior officials met at a villa in the Berlin suburb of Wannsee to discuss the practicalities of the mass murder of the Jewish population. By now, Eichmann was a lieutenant colonel and the head of the SS division responsible for Jewish affairs. He was one of those 15 men as the head of a department that would be crucial to the Nazis' plans. The decision had already been made to commit mass murder, and the men at the Wannsee conference made no objection to it. Instead, they set about planning the practicalities that would make the Holocaust possible, as if it were just another job to be done. Following the Wannsee conference, genocidal operations went into full swing. Eichmann's office was at the heart of the Holocaust, gathering information on the victims, ordering the seizure of their possessions, scheduling trains to take them to their deaths in the concentration camps. Eichmann regularly emerged from behind his desk to oversee operations in the field, witnessing and approving operations in the ghettos and camps. When Germany invaded Hungary in March 1944, Eichmann was there on the first day to start arranging deportations. 
When the Hungarian government later tried to stop the deportations, Eichmann personally arranged trains carrying victims to Auschwitz. As the war approached its end, Eichmann arranged the destruction of incriminating documents from his department ahead of the Allied advance. He was captured by U.S. forces and spent time in prison camps under an assumed name, using forged papers to hide his identity. Fearing that his identity was about to be revealed, he escaped captivity in 1946 and spent the next four years hiding out in Europe. Meanwhile, the Nuremberg war crimes trials had begun, and Eichmann's name had come up in the evidence given by other Nazis, either as witnesses or during their own trials. The whole world heard about what he had done, and he became one of the most wanted men on earth. Despite his crimes, Eichmann still had friends. With the help of an underground network that included Catholic church officials, Eichmann crossed Europe before taking a ship to Argentina, arriving in 1950. He lived and worked there for the next decade, apparently safe from the consequences of his past, and even gave interviews to a journalist about his role in the Holocaust. Back across the Atlantic, the Nation of Israel had been founded to give Jewish people a land of their own, safe from men like Eichmann. In the late 1950s, word reached Israel's security agency Shin Bet that Eichmann had been discovered in Argentina. Not trusting diplomacy and international law to bring Eichmann to justice, David Ben-Gurion, Israel's first prime minister, gave orders for agents to confirm whether this really was Eichmann, and if it was, to kidnap him and bring him to face trial. Having confirmed Eichmann's identity, a team of agents from Shin Bet and Mossad, Israel's intelligence agency, seized Eichmann in May 1960, questioned him, and smuggled him to Israel. These actions caused a diplomatic rift between Israel and Argentina. But while Eichmann's capture was illegal, that wouldn't stop the Israeli courts making him answer for his crimes. Eichmann's trial, a special tribunal in Jerusalem, began on the 11th of April 1961. The charges against him included war crimes and crimes against humanity. The Israeli government made sure that the trial got plenty of media attention, reviving awareness of the Holocaust all around the world. Eichmann's defense relied on the idea that he was simply doing his job and following orders, that under the circumstances he had no choice but to do as he was told. But as the prosecution made clear, Eichmann had chosen to obey, and in doing so had slaughtered millions. The Eichmann trial drew the world's attention, with many responding to it with familiar talk about the extraordinary murderous character of the Nazis. But Hannah Arendt, a Jewish academic and writer, identified something else while reporting on the Eichmann trial. She noticed how cliched his defense was, how boring his way of thinking. This led her to the concept of the banality of evil. Eichmann didn't murder millions because he was extraordinary, but because he was ordinary and complacent, a man without the courage or imagination to challenge the orders he was given. Arendt's writing about Eichmann transformed discussions of morality and the nature of evil. Through examining him, she showed that ordinary people could do extraordinary terrible things, that evil doesn't just arise from fanaticism, but from complacency, acceptance, and ordinary people embracing their roles in corrupted systems. He did what he considered to be his duty, and in doing so, slaughtered millions. Eichmann's trial had redefined the nature of evil, but he wouldn't live to see that shift. He was sentenced to death in December of 1961 and executed by hanging just after midnight on the 1st of June 1962. Adolf Eichmann was an ordinary man whose place in an extraordinary system made him responsible for mass murder. He oversaw the death of millions, then tried to escape the consequences, and later to excuse his actions as following orders. But in doing so, he showed the world how mundane men could commit extraordinary evil, and that obeying orders should never again be accepted as an excuse.